Hey, good morning. Like Josh said, I am Sam. I'm one of the pastors here at the Bridge Church. And as far as pastor jobs go, I have the most fun pastor job at the church because I am the middle school pastor, which is like the raddest job you could have here. I am super excited to be sharing with you today. I've been a part of the church now for almost five years, and there's been a lot of ups and downs, at least the time that I've been here. And I want to tell you over and over again, God has proved to this church that he loves this church, that he is for this church. And as Josh mentioned, we are in the midst of the Forward Initiative and what we're doing over the next two years. We're raising funds to build a building, um, which has been super, super exciting. And so I think this was three weeks ago now, the leadership of the church, which had been the elders, the staff, um, the Forward Initiative team, a couple other key leaders came together and we committed before Commitment Sunday. So that was the number that Josh shared with us as a church before, um, like during Commitment Sunday. And the amount of money that the leadership of this church committed was insane. That the leadership of the next two years committed to give roughly $1.3 million, which is nuts. That day when I got home after church, like, got home and, like, my wife's already there, I'm like, did you really hear that number? <laughs> That's insane. Absolutely insane. Here's what, it, here's what it says to me. What it says to me is there is a group of people here in leadership here that are committed to seeing God do a great work in this community. They're committed to seeing <laughs> more and more people reach with the good news of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you what. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that church. And church, I am super excited. Next week will be Celebration Sunday, and I'm excited to see what, like, the rest of us are committing. Because I know this church is full of serious believers who want to see God do a great work. Today we're going to be talking about how the gospel changes us. The gospel meaning the good news, the good news about Jesus Christ and how it changes us. So when I was 17 years old, I made friends with some Christians. If you don't have any friends who are Christians, I recommend it. Like, like I, you, you, can have, you should have both types of friends. If you're a Christian, you have no friends who aren't Christians, you're doing something wrong. But anyways, so I made friends with these Christians, and these Christians invited me to a Bible study. I did not grow up in church, so a Bible study did not sound that interesting to me. But what did sound interesting to me is that they told me there's pizza there and they play basketball. And I said, I'm about those things. So I start going to this Bible study in my junior year. So I'm going to this Bible study this fall of my junior year. Fast forward to February of 2008. I end up going to this other youth group um, that a friend invited me to. And that night, the pastor was talking about how God is love. How God loves us unconditionally. That no, there's nothing we can do to earn God's love, and there's nothing we can do to revoke God's love for us. That he loves us perfectly and completely, no matter what. He loves us unconditionally. And I'm sitting there, and I'm this 17-year-old kid who came out of a broken family, and the idea of love is a foreign idea to me. That when I was seven, my dad left, and that throughout, and the scars of that and the trauma of that throughout my, teen, my childhood and my teenage years, left me there that day as a kid who did not believe that there was a such thing as unconditional love. And all of a sudden, this pastor is telling me about how there's this God who loves us no matter what. I wanted that. Also, that pastor had some of the students share about how they love God. And I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there in this room full of my peers, some people I knew, some people I didn't knew, and there's these teenagers just like me talking about how much they love God. How much God had done for them and how much they love God. And I remember sitting there thinking, I want to love somebody like that. The beautiful thing about the gospel is that when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, when I put my trust in Jesus Christ, God's love is lavishly poured out upon us and then we get to love him back. That the gospel is a powerful reality. Let's examine how it changes us today. Let's pray together. Father God, you are good and you are wise. Thank you for that. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that as we look at your word, God, that you open our hearts and you open our minds to what you have for us today. <clears throat> Lord God, I pray that you speak, God, that it is you who speaks today. It's in your name I pray. Amen. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12 today. It should be on the screen. 
It's going to read verse 1 and 2 now, and it says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Back to verse 1. Here's what's happening in verse 1. Paul, the apostle Paul, right, who wrote... I think 28% of the New Testament, probably the greatest missionary of all time, he is making an appeal. He's appealing to the readers of Romans to do something. And here's the means in which he is making his appeal. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, and here's a pro tip um, as far as reading the Bible. Whenever you see the word therefore, you ask the question, what's it there for? In this case, what it, Paul, that therefore there, what is pointing to is pointing back to Romans chapter 1 through 11. And here's really what Romans is about. Romans is, the def, is Paul wrote Romans in order to defend the gospel, to defend the good news about Jesus Christ, to defend that you and I can receive salvation through faith by grace. So when he says, I appeal to you, therefore, he's saying, I just examine the gospel from every angle possible to show you that it's true, that's what I'm appealing to you by. And then he says another word. He says, by the mercies of God. And I just want to spend a couple moments on that idea of mercies. That Paul says this. He says, because of the gospel and because of the mercies that God has given to us, it should change us. Which begs the question, what are those mercies? Going back to that story I told you at the beginning, so as a 17-year-old kid, I did not grow up in church, did not know Lord Jesus Christ. So later on that night, I go home in my bed. In my bed later that night, <coughs> excuse me, I pray and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. That I'll always remember the Holy Spirit entering into me. And since then, he's never left me. God has always been with me, which what was happening in that moment. Romans chapter 5 gives us a kind of illustration of what was happening at that moment. For while we are still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's break this down. Paul says, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, he says, For while we were still weak, what he means by that is, you and I are not in a good place with God apart from Jesus Christ. And there's nothing we can do in ourselves to earn our way back to God. So he says, why we were still weak at the right time, Christ, who is Jesus, died for the ungodly. We'll unpack that more in just a second. But the idea of the ungodly, that even though every human being is made in the image of God, and because of that, there is irrevocable worth and value to every single human life because of sin, we are, we are far from God. And we are broken and we are far from God. Meaning that Jesus had to die for the ungodly. Meaning that he had to make a way for those of us who are weak and ungodly to get back to God. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, perhaps a good person, won't even die. But then, in verse 8, he hammers it home. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That we can see the gospel clearly here. That God shows his love for us. That while we were still enemies against him, while we were far from him, why the idea of sin there, the idea of being a sinner, sin is anything that goes against God's perfect revealed will for us. So that throughout his word, he shows us what is a good and, good, and whole, good and holy life. And what sin is, is sin is defying exactly what God has laid out for us that is good. And while we were still willingly and unwillingly, both at the same time, disobedient, Jesus died for us. And on that cross, what Jesus did, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for every sin of every human being. So for you, he paid for every wrong thing that you ever did and every wrong thing that you will ever do. He paid for it. So that through his resurrection, through the power of his resurrection and trusting in him, we might be saved. 
we might be brought back to God. That's the mercies he's talking about. Um, Pastor Timothy Keller puts it this way. The gospel is this. The good news about Jesus Christ is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dare hoped. That both of those things can only be true in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what Paul is doing, going back to Romans chapter 12, Paul is telling us to bring to mind, telling us to remember the mercies of God, everything that God has done for us. Um, didn't share this verse service, but I just want to share this with you. One of the most like healthy spiritual practices that at least has been true for me in my life is I just preach the gospel to myself every day. That I just spend some time unpacking the good news of Jesus Christ to myself every day. Because I'll be honest with you, my heart forgets it really, really quick. And that I need to remind myself. So Paul here is urging us to remember everything that God has done for us. And then the results of that should be this. That we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Jesus in the Gospels tells a story, I'm going to paraphrase this story, about a rich man. And this rich man had somebody owed him a lot of money. Once again, I'm paraphrasing. Say this dude owed him $3 million. So one day the rich man calls the dude who owes him $3 million to himself and says, Hey dude, time to pay up. The man falls to his knees and begs, Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I cannot pay. I cannot pay you back. Please forgive me. And the rich man says, your debt is forgiven. Go in peace. And that guy leaves there. But here's what the guy does next, which was wrong. This guy goes out and he finds somebody who owes him 300 bucks. And he grabs the guy who owes him 300 bucks by the throat and starts choking him, demanding that he pays him back. <laughs> the master catches word of this, and the man is punished. But Jesus tells this story to illustrate a very extreme point. That if you or I have experienced mercy, we should act like it. That if God's grace is a real thing in our lives, then we should act like it is. Paul says to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. A couple things here. First thing here is um, these words don't normally go together. Because when I think of sacrifices, I think of dead animals, which I hope that everyone else in here thinks that, and it's not just me who thinks that. It's also to you online, right? I think of goats in particular, which is weird. But anyways, <laughs> but here's the thing about this type of sacrifice. He is saying that this is supposed to be a living sacrifice. What does that mean? So we're supposed to be a living sacrifice. What does this living sacrifice look like? Holy and acceptable to God. And if, this, if we live like a living sacrifice, this is what it produces, spiritual worship. There's a couple different places in the New Testament that, that uses this language of living sacrifice and particular spiritual worship. One of them is in Hebrews chapter 13. And Hebrews chapter 13 says this, Through him let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. There's two parts here that will help us start to answer this question of what does a living sacrifice look like. There's two parts here. The first one is this. um, Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips acknowledge his name. What What the author of Hebrews is saying there is that when we sing praises to God, what we just got done doing, when we offer sacrifices of praise to God, that's acceptable worship. When I first became a Christian, um, there's a whole lot of things I struggled with. One of those was worship. I did not understand why a group of people would show up in a room and sing about blood. It made no sense to me. <laughs> and then one day somebody explained to me that worship is about telling our hearts how much God is worth. Worship's not about us feeling good, not about us sounding good. The band should sound good, but <laughs> it's about us reminding our hearts how good God is. It's about us giving the praise to God that he deserves. And here's the cool thing. When we sing praises to God, he enjoys that. 
If my wife was here, she would tell you I don't sing, that I, instead I yell, which I'd say I yell beautifully. But anyway, <laughs> that's part of it. So know this, if you showed up today and you sang worship, you offered spiritual acceptable sacrifice to God. But then the second, the next verse says this. It says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Oh, there's another set of sacrifices here. What are these sacrifices? He says that we must not be like this. Rather, instead of not doing good, we need to be people who are committed to doing good and to sharing what we have. So we can start to see this life of spiritual worship. It's a life that is others-focused. A life that is focused on giving praise to God and a life that is focused on doing good for others. If you look at the Gospels and all the, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those, that's the story of Jesus' life. And you could take everything Jesus did in the Gospels and roughly put it into two different categories. First category would be pro- proclamation of the kingdom of God. So Jesus shows up, he unrolls the scroll and says, Today good news has been preached to the poor. So he does and he teaches about the kingdom, what the kingdom is and what the kingdom looks like and how to live in the kingdom. The other part is he consistently, persistently does acts of mercy. Part of what happens when you or I get saved, when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, is this process begins happening in us. This process is called sanctification. And what sanctification is, is sanctification is the process of being made more like Jesus. Jesus who was the embodiment of truth and love. The sanctification is the process of being made more like Jesus. And that's something that God starts in all of our lives as believers and keeps doing for the rest of our lives. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, uh, I just want to tell you real quick, we're talking about some things today um, they are going to sound very unachievable. And the truth is, they are pretty unachievable. And that we as Christians, we're just struggling trying to figure out how to be more like Jesus. That's so, so much of the Christian life is that I've not arrived yet, but I want more of Jesus, so I need to keep striving forward. The New Testament makes this clear. Those of us who know Jesus are ongoingly transformed into people who do good and act mercifully. People who are committed to doing good and acting with mercy. In 1 John chapter 3, John says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for the others. John is making the same type of argument that Paul is making in Romans chapter 12. In Romans 12, Paul is making the argument that if you know the mercies of God, you should live as a living sacrifice. John puts it this way. This this is how we know what love looks like, because Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But then he says this, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. John's making the same type of argument. John is saying this, that if you or I have experienced the love of God, we should love other people. In particular, John says this, but if anybody has the world's goods, the idea of world's goods is your money, your food, your stuff, your house, your time. And yet we neglect to share with people when they're in need. He says, how does the love of God abide in you? That's difficult. That's hard. Because you know what my natural reaction is to, like, my stuff? Like, I want to protect my stuff. I want to keep my stuff safe. I want to keep my time and my money close to myself. (laughs) But that's contrary to what we ought to do with it. He says that we are meant to instead share. We're meant to instead do good. A spiritual, a life of spiritual worship is a life that is committed to serving others. 
It's a life that's committed to serving God and serving others. It's the practice of putting God and other people before ourselves. Back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul then goes on and he says this, and he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul then goes on and he says that we're not supposed to be conformed to this world, more on that in a second, but rather we're supposed to be transformed. And that if we are transformed, part of the results of that transformation is that we may be able to discern what is good, what is acceptable and perfect, what is the will of God. But here's what Paul is getting at in verse 12. Because he says, do not, or verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, he is teaching us that even though somebody can have received the mercy of God, can have received the gospel, the world still presents a threat. And the idea of the world there isn't like the earth that spins around, but rather it's the spirit of the age, meaning it is whatever culture, whatever society is telling, telling us how to live that goes contrary to the goodness of God. So he says, he says, we must not be conformed to this world, but then he gives us some more instructions, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. This is that idea, like, here, like I teach middle school, so here, here we go, right? What you put into yourself changes you. I know this in myself. What I read, what I watch, what I consume, it affects me. You can ask my wife. But here's what Paul is getting at, and here's what I want to get at with you. In particular, in this passage, Paul is saying we need to look back at the mercies of God over and over and over again and let that transform our minds. But what I want to say to you is um, God gave us a book. We should read it. And, like, quite frankly, like, this book, right, this Bible, you don't have to have one that looks like this. This should be a daily practice in our lives. If we want to have a transformed life, we want to have a transformed mind, we need to be in God's Word every single day. Amen. I've been meeting with a 20-something for a while now, once a month, and a few, a few months ago, I um, was meeting with him, and he says this to me. He says, <laughs> Sam, I remember when you were making me read my Bible. What he meant by that is, like, I told him, like, you're going to start reading your Bible every day. And I was texting him every day, like, did you read your Bible today? So I was, like, putting an absurd amount of pressure on him, which is, like, it's good, man. That's how you disciple people. You're mean to them. But anyways, (laughs) there's a teenager I disciple, like, up here, and he's just shaking his head. But anyways, (laughs) but he said to me, Sam, I remember when I, I was reading my Bible only because, like, you were telling me to. Then he says this. Now I read my Bible because I want to. But you can clap about that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good story. But, but hey, that's a transformed mind. That's what it looks like to have a transformed mind. Desiring the things of God. Desiring Jesus. So as you know, we are in the midst of this series called Forward. And there's three things that we are trying to accomplish, three things that we're working to as far as forward goes. Those things are reach, build, and serve. Because, um, like, in case you're new here, we're not just raising a lot of money so we can have a cool building. Like, that's going to be cool, like, to have a building of our own. We're raising money because we want to see God do something amazing in Sarasota County. That's why we're building a building. And as far as a living sacrifice goes, that if you or I want to look like a living sacrifice, live like a living sacrifice, these are pretty good guardrails to do so. First one is this, reach. When we talk about reaching, is we want to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. We want to see more families, more people come to know Lord Jesus Christ. Our neighbors, the people we work with, the people in our schools, everyone in this state, like this whole nation, the entire world. We are com- a life committed to preaching the good news of Jesus Christ is a life that looks like a living sacrifice. 
When we say build, what we're really getting at is we want to be a place where we can see healthy families be built, where we can see families be changed. Because I'll tell you this, you know what can change a family more than anything else? The good news of Jesus Christ. And my friends, if you want to be somebody who's committed to building families, come serve with me on Wednesday nights. Come and just volunteer two hours of your week every week to minister to teenagers, to pour your life into teenagers. A couple weeks ago, I texted one of our leaders a picture of him with a small group and said, hey man, thank you so much. You're an awesome leader. You're such a blessing to those guys. He texts me back and he says this, those guys bless me far more than I bless them. I'll tell you this, if you're committed to serving other people, you're going to get a lot out of it. And then finally, we want to be a church that serves. We want to be a church that serves. We want to be a church that serves our community, serves the world. So last week, um, we had our biggest attendance since we started meeting again. There was over 500 people here in the service. And I'll tell you this, if just like half of those people, just say 250 of those people were willing to give up, say, an hour on a Sunday morning, two hours on a Wednesday night, take a lunch break and go and read with kids instead of sitting in their office. If just 250 of those people said, I'm going to get out and serve for just one or two hours a week, we would see a radical change in this community. My friends, God's mercy is so abundant and amazing to us. Let it change us. If you've never experienced the love of God today, before, you can today. In Romans chapter 10, Paul says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. It's that simple never trust the Lord Jesus Christ, today you can choose to put your trust in Him. You can choose to put your trust in Him as your Lord and as your Savior. And you can experience the love of God and you can see how radical that is in a human's life. And Christian, if you're here, and I'm saying this myself as well, we need to respond appropriately to the grace of God. We need to act like we're changed by mercy. We need to be merciful because we've experienced far more mercy than we could ever imagine. And I want to challenge you that if you are not living a life that looks like a living sacrifice, come talk to one of us. Come back to the next step table and we can try to give you some practical steps, some practical next steps into what it might look like for you to be more of a living sacrifice. Especially if you're here and you're a kid, this is a great place to grow up. God is doing so much here in this church. God is good to us, my friends. And let us remember, a life of spiritual worship is a life committed to serving God and others. Let's pray. Father God, you are good and you're wise. I thank you for that. Lord Jesus, I pray at this time, God, that you convict those of us who need to be convicted. And God, that you comfort those of us who need to be comforted. And God, I thank you that your grace can do both. God, light a fire in our souls to serve you. And Lord God, I pray for anybody here who has not received you, that today could be the day of salvation. And God, I thank you that it's simple and that it's easy to do so simply admitting that we are sinners and asking you to be our Lord and Savior. And God, I thank you that those whom you call to themselves can never be snatched from you. And I praise you for that. It's your name I pray. Amen.